אך אני מקשר עצמי לכל הצדיקים האמיתיים של זה, אני לכל הצדיקים האמיתיים של חוכמי הפרח קדוש עם אשר בארץ המה. הוא יפחד הרבנו הקדוש צדיק יסוד עולם, נחה נובע מכל חוכמה רבנו, נחה נפגן. נח 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 נאום על זכותם, תגן עלינו על בריסא למן. בעזרת השם, today we're going to get started on the סיפור מעבדת בת מלך, the story of the lost princess. רבי נחמן, the first of the 13 tales, and it's going to be a long journey, as we're going to see. I don't even know how we're going to progress with this, but uh, as I see fit, Bizrat Hashem, with the help of the God of Hashem, um, I'll pause the story throughout and try to explain the Avodat Hashem that Rabbi Nachman is trying to tell us. Because obviously, Rabbi Nachman is not just telling us a story, as it writes down in the Zohar, woe unto the person who thinks that the Torah is telling just stories. Rabbi Shem Yochai writes that the story is there to tell us something much deeper. And that's the advice a person has to get and to take in and to bring in oneself to serve God. Obviously, because everything that is told in the Torah is for the application of every neshama. As we know, Rabbi Nachman said this many times, a person has to say the world was just for me. So when you study a Torah, you have to apply that. And as Rabbi Nachman says multiple times, when you read Tehilim, for example, to read the Tehilim as if you're in the shoes of David Amena. So... All these stories are coming to tell each and every Jew, whatever difficulty, whatever challenge, whatever joyous occasion he's going through, how to comport himself or how to go on through life to find God and to what we're going to see to retrieve the lost princess. What that really means is, um, is very deep and it's very Kabbalistic, as we're going to see in the introduction to Sipur HaMasiyot, and uh, the further on we go into the story. But... Um, I think it's fitting that we start with the first two lines of the story, as we said last time. Um, as it starts in the story, the story of the lost princess, Rabbi Nachman tells us these two lines first. Anna ve'ama, Rabbi Nachman answered and he said, and we already discussed this idea. We're going to see a little bit later in the story what he's answering, what type of question he's answering right now. Because it seems a little bit strange why Rabbi Nachman starts the story by saying he answered and he said when there's no question. So, Rabbi Nachman tells us, Baderer si parti ma'ase, שכל מי שהיה שמה היה לו ברכות תשובה, וזו היא. רבי נחמן תלת אז בדרך, on the road, or on the journey, I told a story that anyone who would hear this story had a thought of repentance. And this is the story. And רבי נחמן then goes and begins the story, which we're going to see very soon in the details. Before we get into the story, to understand what רבי נחמן is talking about here, you have to open up Likute Mu'aran, his main book, and understand the word דרך. Because that's the way Rabbi Nachman starts the story. The story begins before he tells the story. As he said, The story is actually, what Rabbi Nachman is telling us, is when he's telling the story. Where he's telling the story. So where is he telling the story? On the road. So what does it mean, the road? This is where we have to open up Likut Moran and delve deeply into a lesson called Kirat uh, Yoshua, lesson six of Likut Moran. A very deep lesson. A lesson Rabbi Nachman revealed I believe at Shabbat, Shabbat Shuvah, one of the first lessons his main student, Rabbi Nathan, ever heard, ever learned from the Rebbe's mouth. And in this story, Rabbi Nachman was telling Rabbi Nathan a secret on what it means to be a student, or the secret, the advice on what it means to be a Yehoshua in comparison to Moshe Rabbein. And we're going to see what it takes to be Yehoshua, what it means to be Yehoshua, not just an, a smart man, or what it takes to really be a student. As we're going to see the... The, the criteria Rabbi Nachman outlines for us. Rabbi Nachman tells us in lesson 6, in section 4, When a person wants to walk on the pathways of Teshuvah, returning to God, A person needs to be a master in Halakha. On the surface level, Halakha means Halakha, the study of Shulchan Abu. But Rabbi Nachman is telling us something a little bit more esoteric. He's telling us, you have to be a baki baracha. And what does that mean to be a baki baracha? Baki beratso, it's lo shene bekiyut, I mean baki beratso, baki beshot. A person needs to have two types of mastery. What does it mean to be a master bahalacha, which literally means in walking or in running? You have to have two things, Rabbi Nachman tells you. The first off, the first thing is called baki beratso, to be a master in running. And the second thing is to be a baki beshov, a master in returning. What that stuff means? Let's try to understand. Okay, Moshe Katuba is brought down in the Zohar, Parashat Vayakel. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai writes 
Zaka'a man de ayel benafik. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai writes, worthy or happy is the one who's able to enter and to exit. What that means is basically telling us, happy is the one who's able to run and to return. What this means, let's move on with, this, with, move on with the lesson. Let's see how Rabbi Nachman explains what running and returning really means. Rabbi Nachman brings the verse from Tehidim in chapter 139. It says, Rabbi Nachman tells us, the aspect of running and returning, the secret of running and returning, is hidden within the verse that Abidah Melech writes in Tehidim. What's that verse? What does it say in the Zohar? Rabbi Nachman tells us, the connection between the Zohar we just mentioned and this verse in Tehidim, this represents ayin, entering. The atziyah she'ol hineka, this other half of the verse, which I'll translate shortly, is bechinat benafek. This is the exiting. What the relationship is between the two, we have to understand the translation of the verse. David Amelech writes in Tehidim, im esak shamayim, if I ascend up to heaven, esak being a play on the words ascend, or literally translated to ascend up, to rise up, shamata, there you are. David Amenach is directing his conversation to God right now. He's telling, he's telling HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if I ascend up to heaven, God, you're there. You're far away from me. The she'ol hineka, but if I make my bed down in hell, the she'ol, in one of the lowest places in all of hell, in purgatory, hineka. Hashem is right here. Which means something very deep. It's a very big paradox, actually. What Rabbi Nachman is telling you is when you think you're close to God, you're actually far. And when you think you're far, God is close. It's the exact opposite of what the world tends to make us understand or make us think. Let's further explain. David Amenach writes, if I ascend up to heaven, there you are. What does heaven mean? It means when a person finds himself in Shemaim, a little bit in the clouds, meaning he's running, he's doing good in Abodat Hashem. He's able to pray properly. He's able to study. He's able to do things in the proper manner, in the way he wants to do. When things are working out properly, it's the heaven. Everything's clear. It's crystal clear. But Shamata, Hashem is over there. What David Amenach is telling us is that when a person ascends up to heaven, you have to understand that God is over there. He's not here. He's not present next to you. Meaning what? Baki Baracha. You have to be a master in running. Why did Rabbi Nachman say you have to be a master in Bahalacha and walking or in running? Because even when you ascend up to heaven, when you think everything is good, when you think you're doing well, you have to tell yourself, I still have a long way to go. Hashem is over there. He's at the end of the room. Let me walk a little bit and let me try to attain more. Let me not suffice with what I have already in my pocket. As Rabbi Nachman tells us, the essence of a Jew is what? La lot mi daga le daga. A Jew cannot be a Jew unless a, a Jew wants to ascend from level to level. You cannot be a Jew if you want to say, I want to stay at the same place. It's impossible. A Jew does not stay at the same place. What we're going to see is that actually part of the journey is the falls, <laughs> or the descents. And that is actually the most important part of the journey. You're going to see it throughout the story. The amount of falls the Viceroy has to, has to descend into and the things, the challenges he goes through. But Rabbi Nachman is telling us that even when you think you're doing well, you have to tell yourself, I have a long way to go. Shamata, Hashem is there. As David the Melech writes, But if I make my bed in hell, meaning even if I'm in the lowest place of my life, I'm doing nothing. I feel as if God wants nothing to do with me. Hineka. Rabbi Nachman says you have to encourage yourself because God is actually right next to the person who's low. As it says in Tehidim, I dwell with the lowly. <laughs> Which means it's an entire paradox. We think that those who are engaged in Abodet Hashem all day are mamash close to Hashem Yitbah. But Rabbi Nachman tells you it's the exact opposite. It's those people who think God is not close to them, which God is actually close to them. So he continues in the verse. As we see here, the difference in between the, the two aspects is David Amalek's writing here. This is the aspect of Ayil, Baki Beratso. When a person finds himself in heaven, you have to understand that you have to run. What does it mean to run? That even when you're running, you still have a long way to go. Continue running. But if I find myself in the lowest place of my life, with all the challenges, with all the bad thoughts, with all the doubts where I don't know what to do, what Hineka Hashem is here, meaning, understand how to return. 
when Rabbi Nachman first saw Rabbi Nathan, the story of Rabbi Nathan coming close to Rabbi Nachman is a beautiful story. It actually has exactly to do with this. Rabbi Nathan Abresta, before he became a student of Rabbi Nachman, he was actually the main student of one of the famous tzaddikim in all of Hasidic history. Rabbi Levi Yitzhak Mibarichev. Rabbi Nathan actually wrote parts of Kedusha Levi. Yeah. <laughs> Rabbi Nathan was actually the main student of Rabbi, Nathan, uh, Rabbi Levi Yitzhak Mibarichev. That so much so, Rabbi, Na- Rabbi Levi Yitzhak Mibarichev called Rabbi Nathan my Nasale. Had a special nickname for Rabbi Nathan. Rabbi Nathan had a very special place in the heart of the Berdich River. Now, as the Berdich River slowly going with his Torah, and he's slowly developing his ideas, that Rabbi Nachman didn't speak a lot about the Tzadikim of the generation, but he spoke specifically about the Berdich River. He said, he's the Pe'er and the Yofi Shel Kol HaOlam. He said the Berdich River is the splendor and the beauty of the entire world. So much so, Rabbi Nachman went further, he said like this. He said that, he told his students once, as he had his students around the table, he said, I want to check my tefillin. My tefillin shel rosh. Why? As it brought down in the biography of Rabbi Nachman, that Rabbi Nathan wrote, why did Rabbi Nachman ask to check his tefillin? Because he heard that Rabbi Levi Yitzchak Mi Berdichev actually went traveling out of his house, out of his hometown. And as he heard that, Rabbi Nachman understood. He said, if the Berdichev who represents the bite of tefillin, if he represents the, 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 the box of the tefillin, which is also called Pe'er, splendor, then there must be a problem with it, my feeling. So let's go check them and let's see if something is, uh, is missing. Something's wrong with them. Why? Because Rabbi Nachman understood if the Berdich is leaving his house, then there must be a problem with his feeling. Why? Because the feeling of Rabbi Nachman already encompassing all the, everything that's happening around him. And when he sees this tzaddik who he calls the splendor of the entire world leave his house, it means the parchment of the tzaddik must have left the bait. Meaning, it might not be kasher. So, Rabbi Nachman ordered that it's feeling you check. This is just a little understanding to teach us the greatness of the Berdichever, the Berdichever Rebbe. So, as Rabbi Nathan was slowly becoming the main disciple of the Berdichever, writing parts of Kedusha Levi, as you know, Rabbi Nathan was um, an incredible scribe, a poet. Um, Rabbi Nachman um, was slowly waiting for that student, <laughs> waiting and waiting and waiting for the right time. He never met Rabbi Nathan yet. And Rabbi Nathan, one Saturday night, as the students of the Berdich River are gathered around for Melava Maka, they do a little raffle, they spin the bottle. Who's gonna go buy bagels for Melava Maka? Rabbi Nathan already at this point had been from tzaddik to tzaddik, trying to find the Rebbe who would really suit him, who would really bring him to the next level. And even with the Berdich River, he still felt something missing. That Saturday night came, as the Berdich River and all the students spin the bottle, who does it land on? Rabbi Nathan Abreslev. As Rabbi Nathan has the bottle, he picks it up and he starts walking out of the house to go buy bagels for Milan Matka. And as he's walking, he sees a Bet Knesset. He sees a shul, a Bet Midrash, and he walks in. And he sees the women's section. No one's in the women's section. Rabbi Nathan walks in the women's section and starts weeping and weeping and weeping. Starts crying. Starts reading Tehidim. Tehidim Alev Bet. He even goes all the way to number 15 and starts crying and falls asleep. Why was Rabbi Nathan crying, you might ask? Because Rabbi Nathan was asking himself the entire walk, what am I doing in this world buying bagels when I'm trying to become the best possible version of myself? So as he walks into the Yizrat Nashim of the Bet Midrash, and he slowly starts reading the Tehidim and starts falling asleep in the book, he falls asleep and has a dream. And in this dream, there's a young man at the top of a ladder, a young face that Rabbi Nathan has never seen before. And what happens? Rabbi Nathan slowly starts climbing the ladder, very tall ladder. Climbs run rung, falls off. Goes higher the next time, starts climbing again. Climb, falls off. And this happens multiple, multiple times until he's about to reach the top. And as he's about to reach the top, he sees the face at the top of the ladder. And as he's about to reach, what did he say? What did he see? He sees this face for the first time he's ever seen. Say, hold on tight, keep climbing. Rabbi Nathan sees that, hears that, and immediately wakes up from his dream. The last thing he remembers. Hold on tight and keep climbing. Time passes by. Rabbi Nathan continues, goes by the bagels, this and that. The entire story occurs. Over the next few months, 
Rabbi Nathan Kiers, his old friend, Rabbi Lipa, who was a traditional chassid, more of a midnaget, let's say, with his sort of stiff avodat Hashem, very strict, very dry. And he sees Rabbi Lipa starting to pray with a lot of enthusiasm, he told her, like the Baal Shem Tov students. So Rabbi Nathan asked Rabbi Lipa, very a big, a older chassid, what's going on here? I've never seen you pray with such enthusiasm. He said, I went and spent a Shabbat with a tzaddik called Rabbi Nachman of Breslau. And uh, he really inspired me to increase my, my level of tefillah. Rabbi Nathan hears this, he says, maybe this is the, the tzaddik that is for me. And uh, he goes, and as he sees Rabbi Nachman of Breslau, he visits him in the town of Breslau. Rabbi Nathan was living in the town of Nemerov. It was just very close, a few kilometers away. He steps foot in the house of Rabbi Nachman, and he stares at Rabbi Nachman, and who did he see? The same face he saw in his dream. And Rabbi Nachman tells him, he says, I've known you for a long time. It's just, it's been a while since we've seen each other. What Rabbi Nachman was telling Rabbi Nathan is that he has been waiting, the soul of Rabbi Nachman has been waiting since the beginning of creation. Just like Moshe Rabbeinu was waiting for the students like Yeshua, who would slowly lead the Jewish people into Eretz Israel. Same is true of Rabbi Nachman. When the tzaddikim are brought into the world, as we know in Sefer Amidot, Rabbi Nachman teaches us that the tzaddikim are consulted before God creates the world. God creates the world with actually the advice and the guidance of the tzaddikim, as he brought down in the Gemara. One of those neshamot was Rabbi Nachman, obviously. And Rabbi Nachman understood that in order to create this rectification to repair the lost princess, which we're going to see is the entire work of every single Jew, throughout the beginning of time, to the time of Adam Rishon, till the end of creation, to the end of the time of Mashiach, with the Mashiach who's going to finish finally. That Rabbi Nachman understood that in order to create or to find this lost princess, he would need to have a student. As is known with every one of the tzaddikim of the generation, specifically the souls of Moshe Rabbeinu. We saw with Moshe Rabbeinu that he had a main student by the name of Yahushua. We saw with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai that he had a main student by the name of Rabbi Abba. Rabbi Abba wrote everything in the Zohar. Came the Arizal, he had a Rabbi Chaim Vita. The Baal Shem Tov had a Magid Mezuch, and Rabbi Nachman said, it's going to be you, Rabbi Nata. You're the one who's going to really bring the Torah out. Because the tzaddik has so much koach, but his light is so strong, he needs a funnel. And who's that funnel? It's a student. Now we think the student is someone who's the widest man, who's the biggest tzaddik. I mean, Nachman's telling you, it's one thing. As he says in this lesson, in section five, he says what? What creates a student of a tzaddik? What makes a Rabbi Nata and a Rabbi Nata and a Rabbi Nata? What makes Yahushua? Yehoshua, one thing, me too. It's called nullification. When you recognize that you have nothing, when you recognize that you are nothing, he's at the greatness of Hashem. Especially when you stand before the tzaddik and you realize that he has so much to give you. When you make yourself nothing, you become a vessel for that tzaddik's life. As Rabbi Nachman teaches us, the more wisdom you think you have, the less you are attached to the tzaddik. That the true attachment to the tzaddik, what's a sign of attachment to the tzaddik? when you recognize how little you know. And that was the beauty of Rabbi Nathan, which we're going to see in the story, slowly with the Ma'adat Bat Melech, we're going to see all this idea of sophistication and wisdom and simplicity with regard to the story. So why am I telling you guys all this? Because as Rabbi Nachman continues, we're going to see part of the entire journeys, the challenges, as Rabbi Nathan had to go through later on in his life, all the difficulties, that Rabbi Nachman, the first thing that he tells Rabbi Nathan before he even meets him is what? Hold on tight, keep climbing. Because that's what he's going to need to keep him alive throughout the rest of his years to try to spread the books of Rabbi Nachman, etc. and spread the light of Hasidut. So, as it continues in this section, when a person has these two types of mastery, mastery in running and returning, when he knows how to engage in the ups and the downs in life, what? Then he walks the pathways of tshuva, of true returning to God, and he merits the honor of Hashem. As it says in the verse, and it continues, and then Hashem's right hand is extended to receive this person's repentance. Nice. Now what does it have to do with derech? Rabbi Nachman teaches us at the end of this lesson, Achidush, written in the Kavanot of the Arizal, that Rabbi Nachman ties all the Kavanot of the Arizal and explains to us the secret of why he uses the word Baki Be'ratzo Baki Be'shov. And what the derech of tshuva really means. What does it mean to walk 
on the derech of tshuva, the pathway of tshuva. What does it mean to walk on a pathway? Rabbi Nachman teaches us at the end of lesson six, derech has a numerical value of 224. Four is dalet, resh is 200, chaf is 20, 224. Now, a person might ask, why did Rabbi Nachman use this specific language of baki berato, baki beshon, to be a master at running, master at returning? Because the word baki, which means to be a master at something, is what has a numerical value of 112. Bet kufiut. Now take those two types of bikiut a person must have, the two types of mastery a person must have. The first mastery, master in running. The second one, a master in returning. 112 plus 112 is 224. Rabbi Nachman is telling us that the derech of tshuva is dependent upon how much a person lives with these two types of mastery. Is a person going to become a master in running or master in returning? Meaning, is he going to be besimcha even when he's down? Is he going to lower himself whenever he's up? When a person does this, then you're able to walk a pathway of tshuva. As Rabbi Nachman tells us in the story, that what by derech sipak that the entire story is told on the derech, meaning for a person who engages in the ups and the downs. Because we know a dead person is a straight line. This is what we call dead. It's stagnant. There's no movement. Rabbi Nachman is telling you, in order to ascend, you have to fall. Not only that, he goes further. He tells us a huge, a huge chidush. Rabbi Nachman tells us three words. The fall is for the purpose of the ascent. Meaning, why do we fall? To ascend, right? That's a simple translation of the phrase. Yerida, that the fall is tachlit aliyah, is for the greater purpose of the later ascent I will follow. But actually, read the words a little differently, and this is the nuance of the words. Rabbi Nachman is telling you what? Yerida tachlit aliyah. That the fall is actually, that the fall is the reason, that the reason why we ascend is to fall. <laughs> that the yerida is tachlit aliyah, the greatest purpose of the ascent, is the fall, is the yarida. Why? Because he's saying the entire work is done when you're low. You're going to see in this story the entire work of this Avodat Hashem of finding the lost princess, which we're going to see what that really means, is all done when a person finds himself in a low position. Not whenever he's happy. Not whenever it's easy. With all the challenges. <laughs> As we're going to see, this entire life is filled with suffering. A student of Rabbi Nachman once came to him, told him all the suffering he had to go through. Rabbi Nachman said, it seems to me that this world is gay enough. In fact, this world is actually lower than Gainam. As we know, the Gainam is actually placed in a spiritual level above this world. It's in the world of Yetzirah. So, we can't even really comprehend the difficulties and the challenges we really have to go through. But Rabbi Nachman is telling us to reinforce yourself. The idea called En Shumi Now, there's no such thing as giving up. And that idea, he's going to present throughout the story as we're going to see the Viceroy doesn't go through many ascents. You're going to see tremendous, tremendous falls. But the one thing that separates the viceroy and allows him to find the princess is one thing. It's what we call longing. To want. Rabbi Nachman said the ratzon is so powerful. The ratzon is the highest faculty that exists in the entire world. Desire, willpower. We think we can accomplish anything without willpower. We just do this. Rabbi Nachman says to do anything in this world, it requires will. To lift up this book, I wanted to. Do, I needed to want to do that, etc., etc. And sometimes Rabbi Nachman says, when you lack the willpower to do something, sometimes the want to want that thing is good enough. Not sometimes, every time. The want to want is good enough, because that want will eventually lead the direct ratzon, lead gagea to long to yearn for that for Akados Baruch We're gonna see here. So, as Rabbi Nachman tells us. That the entire story is told on this derech, which means for a person who wants to up and down, to go on the ups and the downs, to recognize that this is the part of the, the journey of life. That it's not some sort of simple task of saying, I'm only going to, to be happy whenever it's going well. I mean, I'm telling you, no. The main thing is, As I mean, teaches in his, us in a lesson, says the main simcha that exists in the world, true joy, exists only whenever you turn the sad moments into happy moments. It's not whenever it's just happy, when everything's going well. I mean, Ahmed says, sometimes you see a person dancing at a wedding, and you see a group dancing at a wedding, a circle, and then what happens? You see one person on the side always sitting in the corner, never dancing, never has the strength to lift up his feet and to clap, and to engage in that joyous celebration. You'll see it at every wedding. I mean, Ahmed says, that person has been overcome by the Yetzirah entirely. 
But what's the goal? To drag the person into the circle. Because the Yetzirah cannot stand joy. Yetzirah and Simcha are two opposites. Rabbi Nachman says that the Yetzirah and Atzvut are one idea. They're one subject. They're the same source. Depression, sadness, and the evil inclination, the Malach Hamavid, the angel of death, etc., the evil forces, it's all one idea, sadness. And then unhappiness is the Hash HaKadosh Baruch Hu, all the Melech Hayim, the king of life, as we see in uh, Lesson 23 also. But what is Rabbi Nachman telling you? Don't separate the Yetzirah from Simcha. Because then, when the Yetzirah, whenever you're not Besimcha, the Yetzirah is going to attack. How do you truly make the Yetzirah completely vanish? When you draw the sadness into the happiness. When that person who can't dance is brought into the circle. Meaning when those moments which are difficult, you find the Nekudat Tovar, then you find something good within those moments and you recognize that Hashem is actually with you in there, then that turns the Yetzirah completely into nothing. He evaporates because there's nothing left for him to do. The entire work of the Yetzirah is to drag you down into sadness. But if you drag the sadness into happiness, the sadness doesn't exist anymore. So this is the entire work of the story of the Lost Princess because we're going to see here, Rabbi Nachman starts the story. There's a story with a king. It once happened with a king that he had six sons and one daughter. And this is the secret of how God created the world at the beginning of time. We're not going to get into it because this is actually all secrets of the writing of the Arizan, the Zohar Kadosh. As brought down in Etz Chaim, at the beginning of Etz Chaim, Rabbi Nachman tell, or the Ari Hakadosh tells us how the world was created, and how God, from infiniteness, who occupied all space and time and everything, created the world, which is finite, and how He did that through constriction, etc., etc., all the elements. Rabbi Nachman, within the first line, is telling you exactly how the world was created, and how at the beginning of time, the idea of free will was planted. What's the idea of free will? When God brought His kingship into the realm of the evil forces. Meaning that there's good and there's bad now. It's a very difficult concept to understand. A person who Mama studies the writing of the Yari and the Zohar will begin to understand a little bit of what we're saying here because this is super esoteric. But on a simple level, we're going to see what this really means specifically to each and every Jew in, part uh, in particularity, wherever he finds himself. Because this is not a story of the of the generality of creation to each and every Jew. Because we're going to see how each and every Jew has a responsibility to create this rectification. So what's the rectification that we need to do? The tikkun that a person needs to engage in is one thing. Find the lost princess. Who's the lost princess? The malchut. It's God's kingship. Which was at the beginning of time, God took his kingship and basically allowed the klipot to take over, the evil forces to hover over this kingship and to bring it down into exile. And that was, that, that was Adam Arishon's entire test. That if he were to wait until Shabbat to eat from the tree, he would be able to unify the divine presence and God and bring it together, bring the redemption. That was the main thing. And obviously, the entire test came through waiting and there was a lack of patience over there. We're going to see the entire story of Adam within this story. But Rabbi Nachman continued in the story. This one daughter of the king's seven children, six sons and one daughter, the one daughter to the king was the most precious. She was very, very important in his eyes. He loved her the most and he spent much time of enjoyment with her. One time, the king was alone with his daughter, with the princess. On a certain day, he got very angry at her. And a word was thrown out of the king's mouth. We're going to see the language here. Why Rabbi Nachman uses the word? It was thrown out as if it was inadvertent. What did the king say? May the no good one take you. At night, the princess went to her room. And in the morning, nobody knew where she was. Her father was very, very pained by this. And he went seeking out for her back and forth throughout the entire palace. But then comes the viceroy of the king, the second to 
power. Mechamat, and he stood up. Mechamat Shagash Amelach Mitzayim Emot because of the fact that he saw the king so pained and troubled by this. Uvikesh Sheitnu Lo Meshaged Vesus Maod Aratzor, and he requested the king that the king would give him a servant, money, and a horse so that he could go out on his journey to find the lost princess. The Alach Levaksha and the viceroy of the king goes out to seek her out. The Ayam Levaksha Meod and he seeked her out very much. Zman merube meod, a long and very lengthy time. Until he, until he found her. Now I have a question for you. If anyone were to tell a story, does it make any sense to tell you the end of the story at the beginning? In the first line, Rabbi Nachman tells you, until he found her. It makes no sense for any poet, for any storyteller, to tell you the end of the story at the beginning. To, to spoil the entire book. I mean, that one's telling you, forget it. The fact that he finds her is secondary. It's not important. Whether he finds her or he doesn't find her, it doesn't matter. We're going to speak about the journey. We're going to speak about how he finds her. The pathway to find her. The entire journey is the story. Whether he finds her or not is completely irrelevant. Because we're going to see finding her or not is dependent upon how you search. And the search starts with being a baki b'ratzo baki b'shol. A master in running and a master in returning. Look at the language over here. Rabbi Nachman tells us something. When the king started speaking to his daughter, they were together for some, quite some time. They were with each other, enjoying their presence. A word was thrown out of the mouth of the king. Who's the king? Obviously, Akadosh Baruch Hu. But what happens? Something is thrown out of the mouth of God. Inadvertent. As if he's, it's as if he's forced to do it. It comes out without even God recognizing it. As if to say. And what happened? The no good one should take you. What's the no good one? It's clear. It's the evil forces. And what's the, princess, what's the entire journey now? That the king sends the princess. Which is his divine presence. Into the realm of the evil forces. So that the viceroy. Who's the viceroy? Hasheni le the second to the king. What's the word Sheni? The Parparot Achokma is a beautiful commentary. Sheni is what? Rashi Tevot Shoresh Nishmot Israel. Sheni, the second to the the second to the king. Sheni, as you take the play on the words, it's an acronym for the phrase Shoresh Nishmot Israel. Shin for Sheni, Shoresh Nishmot Israel. What meaning to teach us what? Who's the second? To, who's the Who's the hand of the king? Who's the viceroy? Each and every soul of Israel. The root of the source of Israel. When Hashem threw his malchut to the evil forces, he had one thing in mind. As it said at the beginning of time, that Israel arose in God's thought first, before anything, before the creation of the world, before the shattering of the vessels, which is a, an entirely Kabbalistic concept which we're not going to get into. Before all of this happened, Hashem thought of one thing Israel, the Jewish people. And the Jewish people are the answer to everything. But they are the root of the entire problem. It's through the Neshamot of Am Yisrael that we're going to create this rectification of finding the lost princess. So, that something was thrown out of the mouth of God. Let's try to understand what he's telling us. In lesson, I believe, 36, if I'm not mistaken. 35, yeah, actually. I'm wrong on both of them actually. Wait a second. Torah Lamed Hey. Actually. Torah 35. Look what Rabbi Nachman tells us. Pay attention to the words Venizreka. It was thrown out. Nizreka comes from the word Zavka. To be thrown. Something thrown away. Thrown across the roof. Da. In lesson 35, Rabbi Nachman tells us something like this. Da, no. Know this. Ki la makom What is teshuva? What does it mean to return to Hashem? Teshuva, to return. To return that thing which was taken from its place. That's what teshuva means. To return something which was initially taken from its place. That's teshuva. Uh, the Arizal tells us that teshuva is actually put in the words tashuv he. Return the letter he. The letter he is a reference to the last letter of the name Yud Kevav Ke. Yud, there's the he, there's the first he, then there's the vav, and then there's the last he. What's the last he? Represents God's kingship. 
the Malchut, his divine presence, which we call, according to the Zohar, Knesset Yisrael, the gathering of Yisrael. And why it's called this, we're going to see in the story clearly, because the entire reparation of the divine presence comes through the unity of each and every Jew doing his work. That's why it's called the gathering of Yisrael. So Rabbi Nachman is telling you, Teshuvah is Tashuv Hey, right? As we know according to the Arizal. Return the divine presence back to its place, which is next to God. But how do you do that? You have to return it to the place which it came from because it was taken from somewhere. Something was thrown out of his mouth. And what's that thing? That decree that the divine presence would enter into exile. So he says like this, What's teshuva? It's the aspect of the word zaka. What's zaka? It means to be thrown. But zaka is one of the ta'amim. It's one of the ways to sing. It's one of the... Um, the cantillation marks on the Torah. When we sing certain different, uh, different words in the Torah according to the different ta'amim, one of them is called zakka. And zakka, if you take a notice at the, at the uh, what do you call it? At the mark of the zakka, it's like a squiggle. It's returning back to its place. So what is zakka? Rami Nachman tells us, teshuvah. Teshuvah zakka. Why? Because what is zakka represented in the Zohar? It's brought in the Tikkun Zohar. The highest writing of the Zohar, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai writes, "The is derikat la atav and the nitilat mitaman." What zakat? The is derikat la atav, the nitilat mitaman. It was thrown back to the place from which it was taken. That's the zakat. Zakat means to be thrown back to the place from which it was stolen from. Which means what now? Rabbi Nachman is telling you that since the beginning of time, God threw something which He knew at the beginning would need to be returned. The only reason why God threw it in the first place was because He knew that there needed to be a returning process, which is, which is Teshuvah. When something is being thrown out of the mouth of God, it's Zaka. It's thrown back to the place which it comes from. Meaning God had the intention that it wouldn't be thrown forever. He had an answer to the problem before the problem even existed. Israel. And what's Israel? which is what the root of the soul of Israel so Rabbi Nachman is telling you that when the viceroy of the king steps up to the challenge which is each and every Jew who comes down to this world as Rabbi Nachman tells us that before each and every Jew comes down to this world he agrees to go through the challenge of this world to be able to try to engage in this task to unify the divine presence and HaKadosh Baruch and we continue with the story sorry now we're going to tell the story how the viceroy seeked out the princess or sought out the princess until he found her. He would walk back and forth. He would go for a long time in deserts, in the forest, and in fields. What this means, we're going to see right now. He was seeking out the princess for a long time already. It could have been years. He was walking in the desert. What the Midbar represents, we'll see very shortly. And he saw a pathway to the side of the desert. At the corner of the desert, at the corner of his eye, saw a little pathway. And he settled himself in his own mind saying this. By the mere fact that I'm going all this time in the desert, I'm not able to find the princess. Let me go upon this road. Perhaps I'll find a settlement. And what happened? The viceroy takes this road and goes on this road for a long time. What's this road, a person might ask? He's bought the route. How? Let's see how. Rabbi Nachman is telling you that when you're seeking back and forth this lost princess, the divine presence to return it back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which on a practical level means to recognize what your soul is made of, to recognize who you are, because what is this divine presence? It's a collection of all the souls of Rabbi Israel. That's the entire divine presence. Matan Torah, when God gave us the Torah, it was considered a marriage between who? God and us, the Jewish people. It's the same marriage that's occurring between the divine presence and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What's this marriage? When the souls are united with its roots. And how does a person do that? Searching. 
But where does a person search? Bamidbar, in the desert. Rabbi Nachman brings. He brings Bamidbariot in the desert, Basadot in the fields, Bayarim in the forest. These are all the places where a person does not do it. What does Yibodadut do it mean? Seclude yourself and to speak to Hashem. This is the highest form of prayer, Rabbi Nachman says. As Rabbi Nachman says, a Jew should engage in Yibodadut at least for an hour a day. To go into the field, the person can in his own room, alone, away from everyone, away from the eye, and want to speak to God. And it takes time. It goes for a long period of time. The Viceroy is going in the desert for a long time. But what happened? What's the desert? Bamidbar. Medaber. To speak. He was speaking for a long time. But he saw a pathway to the side. What's that pathway? Sometimes we engage in different types of speech. We engage in Torah. We engage in different types of tefillah. But Rabbi Nachman is telling us there's the pathway to the side of speech which is what we call Hidburudut. Why is it a pathway to the side? Rabbi Nachman and Likud Moran tells us a parable. The difference between the prayers we mention every day, the prayers we say consistently every day, and what we call Hidburudut, secluded meditation. Rabbi Nachman tells us like this. He says, when a person prays every single day, Shacharit min Kharavit, whenever a person prays Tehidim, etc., you're saying the same words over and over. And those words become very repetitive. It's very difficult to renew yourself within those words because there's very di- it's very difficult to bring in that concept of novelty, to renew yourself within those words because the words are the same. So you really have to have a lot of strength to renew your energy, to renew your understanding when you're saying such things because the words are the same. So it gets tiring. But Rabbi Nachman says, there's a road, which is a, a shortcut road, it's an alleyway that nobody knows about. And it's called Yibodadu. Why is it an alleyway? Because the other three tzilot a person prays every single day, the other prayers a person engages in every day, is like a highway. The highway, the robber stands on the outsides of this highway, he ambushes the highway, and he waits for the same travelers to pass by every single day. He knows this person is going to get up at this hour and pray at the same time with the same concentration. So what does he do? The robber who's the exile by the evil inclination is going to attack the person immediately when he gets up to pray. Why? Because he knows exactly the way it's going to happen. He knows the exactly in the way, the method, the concentration the person is going to pray. In. This is what we call the main road. But then there's the road off to the side, which Rabbi Nachman says in Likud Moran is what we call Yitvodu. The Yitzhara has no idea where this road is, what the road looks like, and who's traveling on it. Because the truth is, Yitvodu is such a novelty. The idea to engage in prayer, in secluded prayer, to speak to God in their own language is such a novelty that nobody knows it because it's new, it's brand new every single day. You cannot have the same word every single day because your problems are new every day. Your gratitude is new every day. Everything you're going through is completely brand new from the second it begins to the second it ends. Completely different than the day before. There's no two days that are the same. So the prayer in itself is different. It's automatically renewed. And this is what Rabbi Nachman says, that to the pathway off to the side. If a person really wants to find the princess, it's one thing. He'd both do it. To seclude yourself and to speak to God every single day. All the salvations of a person are actually dependent upon this idea. And Rabbi Nachman tells us that when a person actually speaks to Hashem Yibarach and does this Yibodadut, this, this holy practice, to speak to Hashem in their own language, all the things that you're lacking, all the things that you're suffering, and all the things that you feel you don't have. For example, if a person wants to get married, he can't find his wife. Or if a person is struggling with Panasa, Or if a person is struggling with whatever it is. All the things that you're lacking, Rabbi Nachman says, it's actually God is telling you that it's lacking. Or God is making you lack that thing to make you recognize that actually the Divine Presence is lacking just the same thing. Meaning, whatever every single soul is lacking, the Divine Presence is going through the same struggle. The fact that we're lacking our soulmate is because the Divine Presence is lacking its connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And so on and so forth. Everything that we think we're lacking is actually a representation of what the Divine Presence is lacking. And as Rabbi Nachman says, when a person sets the time to speak in Yibod Adut, the Divine Presence descends down to this person and begins to comfort the person over the things in which he's lacking, the things which he needs comforting him, the struggles that he's going through and tells this person, don't worry. We're going to get this over. We're going to get over this together. Because wherever a person is, the Divine Presence is with him. 
It's the same idea. So the person understood, the viceroy of the king understood that you can go and doing the, all these sorts of Avodat Hashem, but a person needs to take the pathway to the side. That means seclude yourself. Go away from the entire world. And what? Speak to Hashem for that secluded time, that secluded period every single day. And engage in that he's able to do that conversation to truly redeem the princess because the princess is this aspect of prayer. Why is it this aspect of prayer? In the introduction to Sipul Masyot, in the second introduction, which Rabbi Nathan wrote, Rabbi Nathan tells us something beautiful. He brings the Holy Zohar, he says, all this idea of the lost princess and what the princess represents is evident in the writings of Yari and the writings of Kabbalah and the writings of the Zohar. We see in the Zohar it says, Man lechivya, yahavine berata de manka de What does it say in the Zohar? Man lechivya, one who kills the snake, which represents the evil inclination. Yahavin le berata de manka is given the king's daughter, the princess. And what is the king's daughter? The Hitzrota. This is what we call prayer. True tefillah is actually the divine presence. If a person wants to find the divine presence, work in that aspect which the divine presence is made up of, which is the tefillah. How do you know the divine presence is tefillah? Rabbi Nachman, in lesson two of Likutim Moran, tells us that the third Beit Amigdash, which is basically the third Mishkan, or the Mishkan, the tabernacle. Why is Mishkan? Because Mishkan represents the word Shochen. It's where the divine presence dwells. The Mishkan was a tabernacle, it was a temporary Beit HaMikdash. The third Beit HaMikdash is going to be an aspect of a Mishkan, obviously. Why? Because the divine presence is going to come down and to be able to dwell within the Beit HaMikdash, the third temple. Rabbi Nachman tells us in the second lesson, he tells us that if a person wants to build the third temple, the third temple is going to come down already built. So it's not physical. So how is it built? Through each and every Jew's prayers. And specifically how? when a Jew attaches his prayers to the tzaddik. When a person, before he gets up to pray, attaches himself to the souls of the tzaddikim who have already passed away, who are alive, and specifically the tzaddik of the generation, that unique soul who is able to build the temple, as we know, it says, about Moshe Rabbeinu, by Aken Moshe Tamishkan. Only Moshe can build the Mishkan, no one else. Because there's one tzaddik of the generation, the Moshe Rabbeinu of each and every generation, who's able to engage in this work to build the, the, the third temple. What's the third temple? Our prayers. Which means to elevate our prayers to its proper place. To recognize that this tefillah belongs in this place. That this tefillah will be the chandelier of the Beit HaMikdash. This tefillah will be the kinog of the Beit HaMikdash, etc., etc., etc. That each and, each and every tefillah becomes a limb of this Mishkan until the entire structure is completely built. By who? The Tzadik. And you see Moshe Rabbeinu once built the Mishkan, he will build the Mishkan again. So Rabbi Nachman is telling you, as Rabbi Nachman brings from the Zohar, what is this idea of the lost princess? It's the king's daughter, which is what prayer. So what does the viceroy of the king do? The Shadil Malchut, the viceroy, engages in the Avodat Hashem to go pray all day. I'm going to spend my, much of my time in Fira. Yes, I'll go to work, but I'm going to spend that hour where I have a way. He's able to do it. Seclude myself with Hashem. To find that pathway a little bit on the side, and this is what he's saying over there with regard to uh, this aspect of the Divine Presence. Uh, and as Rabbi Nathan continues in the second introduction, he says, all of this is evident if a person really looks with his eyes, that the entire exile of the Divine Presence, the gathering of Israel, is what? Is the lost princess. It's the entire story. And this story of the lost princess is just because the lost princess has been distanced from her husband, from her beloved, her beloved really, which is her father, which is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, this is God willing, we'll sum it up before next class, we, Bezat Hashem will go continue with the story. Rabbi Nathan tells us that this story exists for every single person in any single moment, in any single time throughout history. Because each and every person specifically 
has to go through this entire journey, this entire story. And he says, For each and every Jew needs to engage in this rectification. This rectification. To find the lost princess. Which means what? To elevate the divine presence from its exile. You know, according to the Ari, the Ari says, the Ari Akadosh says, that the divine presence was brought into exile and is in the dust. It's down there. It's all the way at the bottom. To lift up this divine presence from the dust, to bring out the holy malchut, the holy kingship from among the control of the evil forces, which have a grasp on this holy malchut. On Rabbi Nachman's last Rosh Hashanah of his life, or towards the end of his life, after he revealed Lesson 5 of Likut Moran Tinyana, when he revealed Lesson 5 of, lesson, of Book 2 of Likut Moran, it was Rosh Hashanah time. Rabbi Nachman, with all students, wearing white, went out in Uman to go do tashlich, to go throw away all the crumbs from the pocket, etc., to really wipe away one sin. As he's doing tashlich, Rabbi Nachman slips, falls in the mud, dressed all in white. All the students rushing to pick him up. Rabbi Nachman says, wait, leave me in here. Rabbi Nachman stays in the dust for quite some time until he gets back up and he continues doing his thing. Rabbi Nachman that was known would be so clean with his clothing there would not be one speck of dirt on his shoe. He'd make sure every, everything was pristine. Why? A person has to look in lesson 29 and leave Moran to really understand the depth behind clean clothing and why the Tamid Chacham has to wear clean clothing at all times. It says in Malash Shabbat that the Tamid Chacham who has a Ketam on his clothing who has a stain on his clothing is Chayam Mita. Is actually liable for death. Which is a very big chidush. And what the stain means is very hidden within the lesson. Rabbi Nachman tells us in Lesson 5 of the Moran, what? That when a person wants to attain the greatest perceptions that exist, the perceptions that our mind can't really comprehend, the question that Moshe Rabbeinu did not have an answer to, which question? The question that why do good people suffer? Why do bad people prosper? Sadiq Veralo, Asha Betobro, as Moshe Rabbeinu asked Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and what did Hashem say? Shtok, kach alav b'machshava. Be quiet. This is the way it arose in my thought. What does Rabbi Nachman tell us in Lesson Five of the Moran Tiyana? When a person throws away all his wisdom and lowers himself to a place which almost seems filthy, just to bring joy to God, a person is able to attain perception of that which even Moshe Rabbeinu could not. The perceptions, the paradoxes, the perplexions of free will, a person is able to attain only when a person decides to what? I'm not going to use my wisdom. I'm going to serve Hashem like a lunatic. I'm going to roll around in mud because I love Hashem. I'm going to jump into a thorn bush because I love Hashem. I'm going to do cartwheel because I love Hashem. None of these things are written anywhere. But because your ratzon, your willpower is so strong to love God, you're going to do these things. Rabbi Nachman tells us that's why he needed to remain in the dust. Because immediately after he remained in the dust, Rabbi Nachman said, I've attained a perception that even Moshe Rabbeinu had a question on. I've attained the 50th gate of Bina. After he dwelt in the dust after that, that amount of time. And why? Because a person has to lower himself to engage in Avodat Hashem, which seems completely crazy on the surface level. We're going to see how crazy it is according to the Viceroy. The Viceroy is going to defy logic Entirely. Everything he does makes absolutely no sense. We're going to see very soon. <laughs> but why? It's all for the search of one purpose. For Hashem. Because I love God. I'm going to divine, I'm going to unify the divine presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, To bring them back together. To bring the redemption. Why? Because I love Hashem. And I might not be the most intelligent person. But I may be the most sincere person I can possibly be. Rabbi Nachman continued. This is the secret of all our service, all the commandments, the good actions that we do, the involvement of Torah, all the good things that we do all of our days. It's all founded upon this idea, this subject. Kabuah Bakhtamim is brought in the holy writings. 
What's the subject? To unify the divine presence in Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Even the simple people, completely simple people, the common people, people who have, or not Tamid Chachamim, who do not even know right to their left, who cannot even tell the difference between their right and their left. Good from that. What is Rabbi Nathan saying? Nonetheless, if they merit to walk on the upright path, which means what? To constantly keep yourself upright, no matter whether you're up or low. According to the best of your ability. According to the love of meaning the best of your ability to remove yourself from bad and to do good. Even a completely simple person knows what the Torah, um, what uh, the Torah forbids. And if his eyes um, are able to completely look away from the bad and to choose good, then all the rectifications in the world, in the supernal world, are automatically done through it. And he merits to be able to elevate the divine presence from his fall. According to how much he sanctifies himself. And what does the sanctification of yourself require? Sincerity. It's that simple. It's really that simple. You do not need to be a Torah scholar. You do not need to be a tzaddik. What Hashem wants is simple people. Simple people who are very sincere. Rabbi Nachman tells us in lesson 9, Hashem rat chafet be'emet. Hashem only wants truth. That's all He wants. To be honest. If you're struggling to do something, Hashem wants you to hear it. He wants to hear you tell Him, I'm struggling with this. If you're struggling to pray shacharit if you're struggling to, to do whatever it is that you need to do, Hashem wants to hear it. He wants the honesty. Nimtza, we find shekol echad mi'ischel who asek lechafes ulakeshet abat menech la'ashiva la'viha. Every single Jew is engaged within this work to involve himself, to search, to seek this princess, and to return her to her father. Shetashu ve'la'viha kinuga to return her to her father as if it's in her youth, same way she was taken away. And according to each and every person, according to how much he merits to engage in this service, that through this, as if to say, he's searching out, seeking out the divine presence to bring it out of the exile. According to how much a person tries, this is how much in equilibrium the Shekhinah reveals herself to this person. The the princess will reveal herself according to how much you try to search. Meaning, according to how much a person tries to find Hashem, Hashem will reveal Himself to you. Even within the darkness of the exile, the strength of the exile, even when it's completely concealed from our eye, and the Divine Presence will come to this person in concealment and reveal herself to him. Reveal herself, her place, where she's, where she resides, where she settles, and what to do, in order that a person should merit to find her. This is the entire Avodat Hashem. And as Rabbi Nachman continues, this is the essential raising of the Shechina from the exile. When you recognize the kingship, how? when you engage in complete faith. The emunah shlema be'emet. Genuine, complete faith. Don't lie to yourself. Be as honest as you possibly can and strengthen your faith as, you pos- as much as you possibly can. And how do you strengthen your faith? Rabbi Nachman tells us in the story. Go in the forest. He's able to do this. Rabbi Nachman tells us that prayer and faith are synonymous. They're the same idea. They're one and the same concept. A person wants to build his muscle, muscle of faith, engage more and he's able to do it. So I think that's a proper place to stop, Bizrat Hashem. We will, uh, God willing, continue starting uh, how he starts his journey and where he starts finding the princess, Bizrat Hashem. Torah Tzfila. Torah Tzfila. Torah Tzfila. Oh, Bracha. Rabbi Nachman. Bishud, all the righteous tzaddikim. May we really have the merit to recognize our own soul. And 
to truly engage in the service, service be'abet, meaning not to lie to ourselves. Because as Rabbi Nachman tells us, as we were talking about earlier, the derech of teshuvah, hayir benafik. The main thing is to reinforce yourself where you are, going to your level. So, bishu the lesson that we just learned, and God willing, in the lesson that we're going to continue to learn, the merit of Rabbi Nachman and all the holy tzaddikim, may we truly engage in this service to find the lost princess, and not only that, to do it in a place of self-sacrifice. I we want to see to do it with a place with complete rid of logic, that we're so yearning for God as if we do it with so much gatzon without any wisdom. So that's the blessing, Bizrat Hashem, may we merit, uh, to truly merit this. Bizrat Hashem.